seven holy orders, talking about the minor orders and tonsure and the subdiaconate and the diaconate and the priesthood. We're going to go through all those things today, and I'll be using primarily for my source, just to keep it easy, we'll, we'll talk some about early popes, but we'll rely primarily today on the Roman Catechism, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and I'll, I'll read through some of these sections on the number of orders and what those orders are, because you know, for most of us who have lived uh, since the Second Vatican Council, uh, we're unfamiliar with the traditional Roman rite. And so uh, we'll begin with our prayer, and then we'll jump right into the content of the seven orders of the traditional Roman rite. And in order to do that, we'll pray in Latin, and I'll put the, the prayer on the screen there. In nomine Patris, et Fidei, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater Noster, qui est in cedi, sancti viceter nomen tuum, adveniant regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cielo et in terra, panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis hodie, et imite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos amalo. Amen. In nomine Patris, et Fidei, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. All right, the seven holy orders, the traditional holy orders of the Roman Rite. Let's just run through them real quick, and I'll, I'll put them up on the screen. Got a little thing here. There we go. So on the screen, you can see the stair steps, uh, beginning with porter and ascending right on up to priest. And you can see the different vesture uh uh, drawn up there and then over on the far left you see Tonjer and uh, there's a young man there and he's got his back to us and that's the reason he's doing that is he's showing us the little bald spot on the back of his head and that's because he's received Tonjer we're going to talk about in just a moment what is the significance of Tonjer we'll look at the three types of Tonjer in the early church and then Tonjer itself is not one of the holy orders but it's seen as the gateway to the holy orders and then you'll see porter he's sort of reaching up and ringing a bell see the bell above his head then you'll see a lector he's not surprisingly holding a book then you see an exorcist he's pointing down to hell and he's holding the book of exorcisms this is a minor exorcist exorcist as opposed to a major exorcist and we'll talk about the difference uh in our time to come here and then you'll see uh the acolyte he's got a thurible there then you see clerics who are vested for the holy sacrifice, the mass. You see the subdeacon, and you can see in his hand, he's holding the book of the epistles, which is what he reads in the solemn high mass. Just above that, you see the deacon. He's wearing the dalmatic, and he's holding the book of the gospels because he chants the, go the, the gospel reading at the holy sacrifice, the mass, the solemn high mass. And then, of course, at the tip top, you see the priest. He's wearing the chasuble. He's holding the chalice. He's holding uh, our Lord Jesus Christ and the Eucharistic host. And there it is. And you'll notice missing from this picture is the bishop. And there's an important reason for that in the Roman Rite, which we will also discuss today. So that kind of gives you the visual of the seven traditional holy orders. Uh, these are mentioned in the earliest, earliest days of the Catholic Church. And they are described and uh, enumerated and defended by Thomas Aquinas, Bonaventure, St. Peter Lombard, really by all the, uh, the scholastics, all the theologians, up until around the 1900s. And, and beginning especially in the 40s and 50s, uh, there's a tendency to, um, to focus only on deacon, priest, and bishop, and of course, as we'll learn today, Pope Paul VI uh, did away with uh, things like subdeacon, exorcist, and porter. So there it is on the screen. And um, I think we'll begin maybe with some, some early church items. Now, this, this, this video is a little bit different. Usually you see me with guests. You see me with uh, Tim Gordon or Father Nix or other people. And some of you may not know that my real job is running the new St. Thomas Institute. So we provide online courses 
uh, and over 50 nations in Catholic theology, philosophy, apologetics. And uh, we've been doing it for a number of years now, and it's it's immensely popular, and um, it's a great resource because there's a lot of people in the world, you know, they can't go to uh, a Catholic college. They can't take courses. They don't have any access to that. We have a lot of uh, students who are in Africa and Asia. Of course, most of our students are in, in North America and in Europe. But it's an opportunity to take online courses, like I said, on any of these topics. And we focus on Thomas Aquinas. And the reason I bring all this up is we're ending a curriculum right now on the Old Testament. It's called Christ in the Old Testament. We're going through every single book of the Bible, Genesis all the way through 1st and 2nd Maccabees. And we're looking for the Christology, the theology of Jesus Christ in every single book of the Old Testament. That's what we're doing right now this year. And if you'd like to join, we're opening our fall enrollment on September 10th. There is a waiting list uh, and that waiting list will uh, be invited to join on September 10th. So if you want to do that, you can go to newsaintthomas.com, newsaintthomas.com and you'll see a page that looks like this and you can see that there's a fall enrollment, you can see that's waitlisted and you can join on the fall enrollment. The reason I bring that up is because beginning in January, I'm going to be leading a year-long curriculum on the history of the Roman Rite. And it'll discuss much of what we're going to discuss today on the seven uh, minor, or sorry, I keep saying that, the seven holy orders, including the minor orders. Uh, we'll, we'll be talking about the, the history of the calendar, the history of the Roman canon, uh, the, the development of the different feast days. We'll look at the old Holy Week cycle as opposed to the new Holy Week cycle. We'll be going through every single part of the Latin Mass. We'll be looking at St. Thomas Aquinas and the way that he goes through all the mystical symbolism that's in the traditional Latin Mass. So if you want to look at the Catholic Roman liturgy traditional from the time of the apostles, from Peter and Paul in Rome, all the way up to today, that's what we're going to be doing in 2019. So if you if you do get on the waiting list and you sign up now, well, when you get in, you're not going to get all this Roman Rite stuff. But beginning January, you will. Right now, we're doing apologetics, scripture, and church history. So that's all just sort of a, a uh, I guess, a, a preview of what's going to happen at the new St. Thomas Institute. Let me throw up something here on the screen if I can find it. This is the, uh, well, there it is. This is the seal of the new St. Thomas Institute, new St. Thomas Institute. And uh, you'll see there in Latin, it says, in Latin, it says, do not bind the mouth of an ox. Why? Because Thomas Aquinas is the ox and everything we do is, is devoted and through the lens of St. Thomas Aquinas. Okay. All that being said, let's talk about these seven holy orders. The earliest reference we have to these seven holy orders actually comes from the year 252. That's right, 252. We're talking about really 60 years or so before the Constantinian era. So this is the church underground. This is the church persecuted. And then a pope named Pope Cornelius wrote an epistle to Fabius of Antioch. And he says in this letter from the pope, to the bishop, I guess you could call him proto-patriarch of Antioch, he speaks of, in the city of Rome, 46 priests, 7 deacons, 7 subdeacons, 42 acolytes, and 52 exorcists, lectors, and porters. Now, in this quote from Pope Cornelius, we have all seven holy orders. We have 46 priests, which is quite remarkable. By the year 252, there is the bishop, the pope, and then he's assisted by 42 presbyters, priests. Seven deacons. Traditionally, Rome only ever had the seven deacons. It goes back to the Acts of the Apostles where there's seven deacons appointed in Jerusalem. Seven subdeacons. So this is the first reference we see of the subdeacons. 42 acolytes. Now, it's interesting here because there's 46 priests and 42 acolytes. That means, it seems, we can guess here, that there's an acolyte for almost every priest. Almost every. And then 52 exorcists, lectors, and porters. 
All right, so we already see that there's exorcist. Now, these are not the exorcists that you're thinking, right? These are these are different. We'll, we'll mention that in just a moment. Lectors who are readers and then porters who, who regulate the sacristy, regulate the doors to the church. Um, we also have Pope Sericius and Pope Zosissimus, and they describe the early path towards the priesthood. And they say that from boyhood till around the age of 20, the young men in the church there in Rome were lectors. They were porters and lectors. Once they turned 20, they went on to acolyte and subdeacon and then deacon and then priest. So remember, back in the early church, there is no seminary. Seminary really comes about after the Council of Trent, after the 1500s. Before that, uh, the training for these young men in the priesthood was really more of an apprenticeship model as they moved up these seven grades of holy orders. And again, for those of you that are just coming in, we are live right now. Uh, I'll put on the screen here those seven holy orders. So they're moving up. And this is really cool because it's a participation in the priesthood. Little by little, they take on more and more functionaries or, or functional tasks of the priesthood until finally they are a priest able to confect the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Now, before all that happens, as we mentioned, you can see on the far left there is our our little guy. He's tonsured. He's got that little bald spot on his head. And I wrote an article many years ago in which I I talked about the, the role of tonsure in the early church. And there were in the early church, three kinds of tonsure. Uh, just so you know what I'm talking about, let me let me put a tonsure up on the screen here. That worked. Okay. This uh, this is a, a contemporary picture here. This is the tonsure, and you can see everything is shaved here except for this crown of hair around the edges. Here's another one. There, that's a woodcut, an older woodcut. Now that's the Roman tonsure. All right, so that's one of the early kinds of tonsure. This is called the Roman or the Petrine tonsure, and uh, it's the one that we we're familiar with. It's a a big bald spot with kind of a halo going around the edges. And in the early church, they said that this was um, what Peter wore in honor of the crown of thorns of Jesus Christ, and it was adopted by the Roman clergy. It's quite uh, common. However, when the, when the Catholics were engaging and evangelizing the Christians on the British Isles, they discovered a different kind of tonsure, and it's called the Johannine tonsure, sometimes called the Triangle tonsure, sometimes called the Celtic tonsure. And people debate exactly what it looks like. Again, we don't have pictures, but it seemed to have been a, a triangle carved into the top of the head. Um, some of the Romans went so far as to say that this was the tonsure of Simon Magus. Probably not. Probably just rhetoric. But this triangular Celtic tonsure was eventually condemned by the Fourth Council of Toledo. So it faded out. We didn't have it. Now, the third kind of tonsure is what's called the Pauline tonsure or the Eastern tonsure. Um, this was very popular in the east, in the Byzantine areas of the church, and it was just a straight shaved head, no halo around the edges. So this tonsure was completely just a shaved head. And we have a little uh, interesting uh, historical tidbit on this. When Theodore of Tarsus was consecrated as the Archbishop of Canterbury, this was around the year 668, he was from the east. And he wore the Eastern Pauline tonsure, fully shaved. But when he was consecrated as Archbishop of Canterbury, now he's over in, in the West, in Roman territories, he had to take some time and grow out that piece around the sides to be in conformity with the, the Roman custom uh, of the Roman or the Petrine tonsure. Now, as time went on, the tonsure especially amongst secular or diocesan clergy, it became much smaller. Uh, it was said to stay, I think the old books say it had to be as big as a silver dollar. Now, in certain countries, after the Reformation, 
Protestant countries like England, I think America as well, they were dispensed from wearing the tondrin. And then, of course, after Vatican II, completely gone, no longer around. Only traditional orders wear something like you see uh, right here over my right shoulder, that traditional Petrine tondrin. Or some might even wear just the smaller silver dollar. What is the origin of this? There's a lot of debate on it. Um, of course, there's the one I mentioned before that it relates to um, Peter wearing a kind of a, an honor of the crown of thorns. Uh, others have suggested, and this this is, I think, a, a, a good account, and that is presbyter in Greek means old man. It means one who's dignified with the wisdom of old age. And it might just be that shaving your head is a sign of humility, right? It's, you know, but also... It's a sign that, hey, I'm a presbyter. I am an old man. I am set apart. Another cool thing about the tonsure is the old school tonsure. It was the sign of being a cleric, not the Roman tab. This. And an important thing about that is, is there was no room for dissimulation. You couldn't take off the tab and go to a tab a tavern or a brothel or whatever, or the horse races or whatever, you know, vicious thing you wanted to do. It was on your head. Right? There's no disguising it. So that was another great use of the tonsure. So the tonsure was, in a way, and in the in the Greek church, eventually the, that Pauline shave moves away, and they, they have it maybe at the beginning, but then they grow it out. So it happens at the beginning of the ordination rite, and this happens in the West as well, and then it begins to grow out or be maintained in a, in a slow way. In the traditional groups like the Fraternity of St. Peter or the Society of St. Pius X, Institute of Christ the King, they still give the tonsure. Now, these men don't, don't, don't look like you see the picture here uh, on either of my shoulders, um, but they do receive a liturgical rite of the tonsuring, and I think, personally, I think it's pretty cool. Okay, so I'm going to read from the, um, the Catechism of Trent, the Roman Catechism, and uh, it begins by repeating what is in the Council of Trent that there are seven orders. Uh, it says they are divided into major or sacred and minor orders. The major or sacred orders are priesthood, deaconship, and subdeaconship, while the minor orders are those of acolyte, exorcist, lector, and porter, concerning each of which we shall now say a few words so that pastors may be able to explain them to those especially whom he knows to be about to receive any of the orders in question goes on to talk about tonsure, which I think we've covered enough. And then he moves on to porter. Porter. This is related to the Latin word for a door. This is a doorkeeper. The Roman Catechism reads this. After tonsure, it is customary to advance to the first order, which is that of porter. The function of porter is to guard the keys and doors of the church and allow no one to enter there to whom access has been forbidden. Formerly, the porter used to assist at the holy sacrifice of the Mass. To see that no one approached too near the altar or disturbed the priest during the celebration of the mysteries. Other duties were also assigned to him, as may be seen from the ceremonies used as ordination. Thus, the bishop, taking the keys from the altar, hands them to he him who is to be made porter and says, Let your conduct be that of one who has to render to God an account of those things that are kept under these keys. All right, so there is the porter. He is, uh, in a way, he's a sacristan. And he keeps the keys. He also, you, you kind of see this in the English tradition. Uh, there's a guy called a verger. He carries a stick, and he goes before the procession of the, the clerics, the servers, the deacon, the priest. And he sort of protects them you know he kind of opens the way in the crowd and kind of moves people away so he's he's a sacristan he guards the vessels he has the keys to the church the keys to the sacristy and he's also kind of a bodyguard in the early church that's the porter now the second one is the lector or the reader and the roman catechism and by the way everybody buy this book the catechism of council trap this is the baronius version it's it's awesome I mean, it's very beautiful. It's got a nice ribbon in it. I love it. All right, so Roman Catechism of Trent. The second degree of orders is the office of reader, whose duty it is to read in the church in a clear and distinct voice the books of the Old and New Testament, 
and especially those which are read during the nocturnal psalmody. Formerly, it was also his duty to teach the faithful the rudiments of the Christian religion. So the reader reads the lessons not in Mass. Traditionally, the reader reads the lesson in the what the Catechism calls nocturnal psalmody. This is the traditional um, breviary office of Matins, the lessons, the lections that are in Matins. So it, it has its root in the monastic tradition. And then also it says that he's the original catechist. He's teaching the, the catechumens the rudiments of the Christian religion, probably the early creed, right? And he's also helping them towards baptism, overseeing them. So that's the reader, all right? And I'll put the, put the graphic back on the screen. You can see it. All right, so the second step there, we got lector or reader. And the third one, as we move now, is exorcist. All right, the Roman Catechism says, The third order is that of exorcists, to which is given the power to invoke the name of the Lord over those who are possessed by unclean spirits. Hence the bishop, when ordaining them, presents to them a book in which the exorcisms are contained, and at the same time pronounces this form of words. Take and commit to memory, and have power of imposing hands over the possessed, whether baptized or catechumen, end quote. So this is uh, this is not the major exorcist, you know. Like when we talk today of in the diocese, there's usually a a priest who's been deputed by the bishop to to be the exorcist for the diocesan region, right? And this guy's taking on extreme, uh, you know, fully possessed people. In the early church, there was this office. We would call it the the office or the order of minor exorcist. This minor exorcist had a uh, a collection of exorcism prayers. And we read in the early church that daily, the faithful who were being tormented by spirit, so maybe they're not even possessed, maybe they are possessed, they would come, and, and this is sort of the, the triage, right, in the early church. They would come to these men who were minor exorcists, and the minor exorcists would lay hands on them and pray for them, both catechumens and the baptized. So you can see with the reader and the exorcist, the reader's teaching and then just above the reader is the exorcist. He's laying hands and praying deliverance prayers over these people. So that's that's the role of the minor exorcist. It's pretty cool, pretty powerful. And again, you'll remember in that Cornelius uh, quote, that Pope Cornelius quote that I read earlier, he mentioned, it's a little bit, uh, I'm not quite sure on the Latin here um, how to read it, but he says 52 exorcists, and then he says lectors, porters. So, it might be that exorcist lector porters adds up to 52, or it could be maybe that there's 52 exorcists. I'm not sure. Regardless, in the year 252 in Rome, there were exorcist lectors and porters active under the Pope. All right, that brings us to the next order, and that is the order of acolyte. And the Catechism of Trent reads this. The fourth degree is that of acolytes. And it is the last of the orders that are called minor and not sacred. Their duty is to attend and serve the ministers who are in major orders, that is, the deacon, the subdeacon, and the sacrifice of the altar. They also carry and attend the lights during the celebration of the sacrifice of the Mass, especially during the reading of the Gospel, from which fact they are called candle bearers. So the acolytes here are entering into the holy sacrifice right now it's true that the reader ha does read in matins in the monastic offices but here we finally see one of the orders entering into service at the altar the holy sacrifice of the mass the roman catechism goes on to read therefore at the ordination of acolytes the bishop observes the following right first of all he carefully warns them of the nature of their office, then hands to each of them a light, saying, Receive this candlestick and candle, and remember that henceforth you are given the charge of lighting the candles of the church in the name of the Lord. Then he hands them empty cruets, in which are presented the wine and water for the sacrifice, saying, Receive these cruets to supply wine and water for the Eucharist of Christ's blood in the name of the Lord. So that's how they are ordained and set into their 
into their offices. So that brings us up through the the minor orders. And uh, it, it's pretty awesome. Now, and we're going to talk about in a little bit why uh, some of these have been suppressed in our own time. But on that topic brings us to Sub Deacon. I love Sub Deacons. I'm going to put a little picture on the screen here. Um, there on the screen, you can see uh, a deacon, right? He's holding the uh, book of the Gospels there. He's wearing a dalmatic. In this picture, it's Rose. And then next to him is a subdeacon. He's a little bit taller. He's wearing the tunicle, in this case, a green one. And you'll see that both of them are wearing the maniple on their left arm. And uh, early, early, early on in the church, uh, the the clergy, the subdeacon, the deacon, and the priest wore the maniple. Early on, it was made of linen. Uh, it did not match the actual uh, vestments. It wasn't colored. Later on, it was colored. But it was uh, linen, and it was placed over the arm, and it signifies service. You know, like when you go to a nice restaurant, and the waiter comes over, and he's got his arm like this with a, a freshly pressed white napkin linen it means he's there to serve and this is a reminder that the the subdeacon the deacon and the priest are there to to serve the faithful holy communion but chiefly to serve almighty god in true worship in the holy sacrifice of the mass so the subdeacon this is the one i think that people are most unfamiliar with uh, the catechism of the council of trent says, now, the subdiaconate is the first degree of major orders. Its function, as the name itself indicates, is to serve the deacon at the altar. It is the subdeacon who should prepare the altar linen, the vessels, and the bread and wine necessary for the celebration of the holy sacrifice. He also, it is, who presents water to the bishop or priest when he washes his hands during the sacrifice of the Mass. It is also the subdeacon who now reads the epistle which in former times was read in mass by the deacon. He assists at witness, he assists as witness at the holy sacrifice and guards the celebrant from being disturbed by anyone during the sacred ceremonies. So the subdeacon we just read there, he serves the deacon, that's why he's subdeacon, and he serves the priest. So he's serving both. All of this is hierarchical. The Catechism continues, The various duties that pertain to the subdeacon are indicated by the solemn ceremonies used at his ordination. In the first place, the bishop warns him that the obligation of perpetual continence is attached to this order and declares that no one is to be admitted among the subdeacons who is not ready and willing to accept the obligation in question. Okay, so before Vatican II in the Roman Rite, before the changes that were made by Paul VI, when you became a subdeacon, you had to pray the breviary, the divine office, the liturgy, the hours, and you were bound to perpetual celibacy and continence. So after you received subdeacon, you could not get married. right? You were consecrated for service at the altar. You're touching the sacred vessels. You're performing and, and praying the divine office, and you are totally set aside for the Lord in this eschatological way. So celibacy is received by the subdeacon. Now, nowadays in the Roman Rite, after the changes of Paul VI, that now begins with the deacon because the subdeacon has been done away with. Right. So when a man becomes a deacon as he's moving on to the priesthood, that's when he receives um the the obligation to be celibate and completely continent for the rest of his life. But in older times, in the ancient Roman Rite, and even before Vatican II, it began at subdeacon. That's a very important uh, thing for everybody to understand. This this shows how important the subdiaconate was. It wasn't just a minor order like acolyte. Right? I mean, look at the picture on the screen. He is vested. He's chanting the epistle. He's touching the vessels. Subdeacon. Now, the Roman canon goes on to read this. The various duties that pertain to the subdeacon are indicated by solemn ceremonies used at ordination. In the first place, the bishop warns him 
that the obligation of perpetual continence is attached to this order and declares that no one is to be admitted among the subdeacons who is not ready and willing to accept the obligation in question. Then, after the solemn recitation of the litanies, the bishop enumerates and explains the duties and functions of the subdeacon. Thereupon, each one of those who are being ordained receives the chalice and sacred patent from the bishop. And to show that he is to serve the deacon, the subdeacon receives from the archdeacon cruets filled with water and wine together with a basin and towel with which to wash and dry the hands. Now, you'll notice the acolyte received cruets that were empty. Here, the subdeacon receives cruets that have water and wine in them. This shows that he's ready to serve at the altar, to serve the deacon and serve the priest. At the same time, the bishop pronounces these words. See what sort of ministry is entrusted to you. I admonish you, therefore, to show yourself worthy to please God. Other prayers follow, and finally, when the bishop has clothed the subdeacon with the sacred vestments, that's the tunicle that you see right there on the screen, for each of which there are special words and ceremonies, he gives him the book of the epistles. Receive the book of the epistles with power to read them in the holy church of God, as well as for the living and for the dead, end quote. Now, it's real, I like to bring this up a lot with people because reading the epistles, and we'll see also with the ordination of the deacon, and reading the gospels is done for the living and the dead. The priest celebrates mass for the living and the dead. The deacon reads the gospel for the living and the dead, and the, epist and the subdeacon reads the epistle for the living and the dead. This tells us something. In the Roman rite, reading the epistle and reading the gospel isn't just reading it to the audience present. Reading it is an oblation. Reading it is a propitiatory sacrifice for the living and the dead. This is why if you attend the traditional Latin Mass, they won't read initially the epistle and the gospel in vernacular. They will recite it in Latin for the living and the dead, and then they'll recite the gospel in Latin for the living and the dead. And then later at the pulpit, they might translate it, usually they do, into vernacular. So here in America, he'll say uh, the epistle appointed today, and he'll read the epistle in English for us to hear. And then he'll say in the gospel appointed, everyone will stand up. He'll read the gospel in the vernacular, and then he'll preach his sermon. But that initial reading in Latin, and it's chanted in the Solemn High Mass by the subdeacon and the deacon, is for the living and the dead. It's an oblation. So we need to understand that. That's a big distinction that, that gets lost, I think, in the Novus Ordo uh, and in the, in the, the Reformed uh, uh, Mass uh, that's, that Paul VI created. Okay, so now we move on to the deacon. All right, so the deacon, you see him on the picture there. He's got that uh, rose-colored dalmatic, and uh, he's holding the Book of the Gospels. The Catechism of the Council of Trent. And by the way, if you're enjoying uh, this lesson on YouTube, we're live right now, by the way. Uh, if you're enjoying it, please use that share button uh, below this video and share it on YouTube and on Facebook. I'd really appreciate that. That helps other people find it. And of course, you can subscribe as well to this channel. Hit the bell to get notified for... Uh, future shows. We're doing a little bit different. Um, I just wanted to do a little preview for our new St. Thomas Institute lesson on the history of the Roman Rite, which will begin in January. It doesn't begin now, but we do have uh, enrollment beginning for the fall uh, semester, fall uh, period, and uh, that's going on right now. There's a waiting list, but you can uh, enroll now and uh, hopefully get in. We have a limited number of spots for new students. And uh, there it is. Okay, so back on to Deacon. The Catechism of the Council of Trent says that the second degree of the sacred orders is that of deacons, whose functions are much more extensive and have always been regarded as more holy. His duty is to be always at the side of the bishop, guard him while he preaches, serve him and the priest during the celebration of the divine mysteries, as well as during the administration of the sacraments, 
and to read the gospel in the sacrifice of the Mass. In former times, he frequently warned the faithful to be attentive to the holy mysteries. You see this in the Eastern Rite, by the way. The Catechism goes on to say, He administered our Lord's blood in those churches in which was the custom in which the custom existed that the faithful should receive the Eucharist under both species, and to him was entrusted the distribution of the church's goods, as well as the duty of providing for all that was necessary to each one's sustenance. Now, the deacon is associated with the chalice and with the precious blood, and you see this in the Holy Sacrifice, the Mass, in the traditional rite as well. Traditionally, according to... Um, canons prior to Trent, through Trent, in Trent, even recorded here, the priest is the only one who administers the host to the faithful. That's because the priest has his hands consecrated to touch the host. The deacon, when both kinds were administered, only served the chalice. He could touch the chalice, but his hands weren't consecrated. So he could touch the sacred vessels, but he couldn't touch the host. Of course, he couldn't touch the precious blood. No one would do that. But he couldn't touch the host. Now, he was an extraordinary minister of the Eucharist. So in certain situations, he could touch the host. But ordinarily, only a priest can touch the host and distribute the host to the faithful. Another traditional distinction that's been lost that we need to talk more about. All right, let me find my place here. Okay. The deacon, going back to the Catechism of Trent. To the deacon also, as the eye of the bishop, it belongs to see who they are in the city that leave a good and holy life, and those who do not, who are present at the holy sacrifice and sermons at appointed times, and who are not, so that he may be able to give an account of all to the bishop and enable him to admonish and advise each one privately, or to rebuke and correct publicly, according as he may deem more profitable. This whole thing assumes that the bishop and the clergy actually are rebuking, and it even says here, rebuke and correct publicly the lay faithful. Imagine today if the bishop said, talk to their deacons and said, hey, what's going on in the diocese? You know, do we have any scandalous behavior? Is this politician doing crazy stuff? And they're like, yeah, yeah, we look into it. Yeah, okay. And the bishop said, okay, I need to call that person out. Thanks, deacon so-and-so. Thanks for letting me know. That was that's that's the traditional role of the deacon. How much we've lost. How much we've lost. He should also read out the list of the catechumens and present to the bishop those who are to be admitted to orders. Finally, in the absence of a bishop or a priest, he can explain the gospel, but not from the pulpit. Thus letting it be seen that he this is not his proper office. Whoa! This has been changed since the 1970s. Let me tell you this. It says that deacons can, in the absence of a bishop or priest, preach the gospel, but not in the pulpit. And it says here in the Catechism of Trent, letting it be seen that this is not his proper office. So there's a major distinction here about the bishop, I mean, sorry, about the deacon in his role as a preacher. He can do it, but he can't do it in the pulpit, according to this beautiful book with papal, with papal approval. Catechism goes on. The apostle shows the great care that should be taken that no one unworthy of the diaconate be promoted to this order. When in his epistle to Timothy, he sets forth a deacon's character, virtues, and integrity. The same point is also gathered from the rites and solemn ceremonies which the bishop employs when endorsing when ordaining him, the deacon. The bishop uses more numerous and more solemn prayers at the ordination of the deacon than at the subdeacon. And he also adds other kinds of sacred vestments. Uh, this would be, for example, the deacon gets a stole. He doesn't wear it over both shoulders like a priest, but he does wear it crossways, whereas the subdeacon does not get to wear a stole underneath his dalmatic. Moreover, he imposes hands on him just as we read in the, that the apostles used to do when ordaining the first deacons, and it's referring to Acts chapter 6 here, by the way. If you want to read about the creation of deacons in the Bible, that's Acts chapter 6. Finally, the bishop hands him the book of the Gospels with these words, Receive the power to read the Gospel in the Church of God, both for the living and the dead, in the name of the Lord. Okay, so here again we see 
that the deacon chants and recites the gospel for the living and the dead. Reading the gospel in the holy sacrifice is an oblation. It is a propitiatory sacrifice, not like the Eucharist. I know that, okay, totally different, but it is an offering. It is something done as a suffrage for the living and the dead. Profits them. That's why even in the the traditional Latin Mass, they do, they shouldn't. I know it happens some places. They should recite or chant the epistle and the gospel in Latin because it's part of the oblation. And then later, at the sermon, do it in the vernacular. That's the way to do it. That's the traditional way to do it. Okay. Finally, we come to the priest. And I'm going to take our, our deacon and our subdeacon off the screen. I'm going to remind everybody here of, uh, let's see, is this, the, no, that's not it. Wrong picture. The, here it is. The orders. Okay. So we've, we've ascended all the way from Porter, Lector, Exorcist, Acolyte. Then we moved into the major orders of subdeacon, deacon, and priest. We've covered the subdeacon and the deacon. Oh, there's something that I forgot to mention uh, before we move on to priest. And that is in the, the traditional Roman rite, and I'm going to go over this at the New St. Thomas Institute beginning in January when we go deeper into this kind of stuff. We'll, we'll, we'll do the seven orders, but we'll go a lot deeper and we'll bring in St. Thomas Aquinas and we'll bring in uh, you know, some Thomas and you know, we might even look at Bonaventure and maybe even Duns Scotus. Don't tell the Thomas. We'll look at some of these things. In the tradition at the Mass, the priest represents Jesus Christ. Obviously, he's in persona Christi. The deacon represents the Gentiles, the nations, the heathens. And the subdeacon signifies ancient Israel, the people of God, the Israelites. And so I can't go into it all now because it would take a full hour, uh, but I will do it in uh, New St. Thomas Institute in our, our curriculum on the Roman Rite. Uh, starting in January. During the liturgy, the way that the priest, the deacon, and the subdeacon interact tells us the story of redemption. Um, Christ coming to save both the Jew and the Gentile, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, and this great mystery that happens over time with the Catholic Church. It's really, really a, a beautiful analogy, a, a drama that's being played out in the old traditional sacrifice of the Mass. And I'll also go through Thomas Aquinas. He has all of these mystical significations that happen through the Latin Mass. Some of them are still in the Novus Ordo. A lot of them are not. I, I once did it before in, when we were in New St. Thomas Institute, we were doing um, uh, sacramental and Eucharistic studies. This was in our certificate on uh, Catholic theology. And we were doing Eucharistic studies. I did a two-part video uh, for the students at NSTI and I went through all the mystical significations that Thomas Aquinas does in the Mass. But I, I wasn't super clear that this were only in the traditional Latin Mass. So people went to Mass the next Sunday and they said, hey, uh, Dr. Marshall, uh, all that stuff, Thomas Aquinas, like I didn't see these things that Thomas Aquinas was talking about. And I said, well, if you go to the Novus Ordo, you're going to miss some of those things because they've been taken out. Right. So Thomas Aquinas was, you know, he died in 1274. So he was saying the Latin Mass. He didn't. He didn't know the Novus Ordo. So the, when he's talking about the mystagogy of the Holy Mass, he's dealing with what he's got, which was the traditional Latin Mass. So yeah, you can't go to the Novus Ordo and and understand what Thomas Aquinas is saying. However, if you do go to the traditional Latin Mass, you're going to see every single tidbit that Thomas Aquinas is talking about because it's there. And again, we'll we'll cover that as we get into our our curriculum at New St. Thomas Institute. So finally, we come to the peak and the summit of holy orders, and that is priest. And the reason it's the highest is because the greatest thing that a human can do besides be the mother of God, the Theotokos, Blessed Virgin Mary, right? To be the mother of the divine Logos, right? So the next most amazing thing that a human can do is confect the blessed sacrament on the altar. 
that bread and wine would transubstantiate miraculously into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ on the altar. Whoa, right? A priest can do that. In Thomas Aquinas, we'll, we'll talk about bishops in just a minute because that's kind of a, a, another topic related to this. So the Roman Catechism, Catechism of the Council of Trent, beautiful book. This is the Baronius version. Love it. It's on my night. I'm a total nerd. This is on my nightstand. I read this all the time. For priest, the Roman Catechism says, the third and highest degree of all sacred orders is the priesthood. The fathers of the first centuries usually designated those who had received this order by two names. At one time, they called them presbyters, a Greek word signifying elders, old men, not only because of the ripe years very necessary for this order, but much more on account of their gravity, knowledge, and prudence, for it is written, Venerable old age is not that of long time, nor counted by the number of years, but by the understanding of a man is gray hairs, and an unspotted life is old age. At other times, they called them priests, and the Latin here is sacerdos. Sacerdos, which comes from Latin. Here's our, I like to do a Latin word, Latin word of the week every show, and today our Latin word will be sacerdos. Sacer is, is Latin for sacred holy. Uh, it's even beyond, so there's sanctus, like sanctus, sanctus, sanctus is holy. Sasser, you know, the sacred is even, it's like super set apart, right? And so, and then the second part is dos. Uh, this comes from the Latin do dare, which means uh, to give. So a sacerdos is one who gives holy things. And the priest, the sacerdos, he gives holy things to us, the Eucharist, but also to God. He offers Jesus Christ the most sacred to God the Father in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So pretty awesome. Now, it mentions here that in antiquity, the, the priests were called presbyterists because they're old. And, and just the other day, this is going to hold, hold on with me here. I'm going to have to look it up. Just the other day, I was um, reading the Liber Pontificalis. And it was talking about the the age of priests and, and when they were admitted in early Rome. Hopefully I can find it. Ah, here in my notes. Here it is. So it stated that by Pope Sylvester that a man should be reader until age 30 age 30, then exorcist for 30 days, acolyte for five years, subdeacon for five years, custodian of the tombs of the martyrs for five years, then be a deacon for seven years, and then if, to be a bishop, be a priest for at least three years. So I did a little math, carried the one, and according to Pope Sylvester, if you followed his arrangement, you could be a priest in Rome no earlier than the age of 52. That's right. Add it up. You're a reader till 30, then exorcist for 30 days, acolyte five years, subdeacon five years, custodian of the martyr's tombs five years, deacon for seven years. That puts you at age 52. This means that in the early church, the priests and the bishops were older men. Guys weren't getting ordained super early. Now, later on, around the year 418, so this is after Constantine, you have Pope Zosimus, and I mentioned him earlier. He says that you're a reader till 20, or as Pope Sylvester said, Pope Sylvester was the Pope, by the way, during the pretty much the whole life of Constantine. All right, so from the, the conversion of Constantine, in fact, the Roman tradition says uh, Pope Sylvester baptized Constantine in Rome, but Sylvester is the one who is there all during the conversion of Constantine. So he's kind of the, the bridge pope from the pre-Constantinian to the post-Constantinian. According to his numbering, earliest year of priest is 52 years old. Later on, Pope Zosimus, 418, he says a man is baptized, if he's baptized as an infant, he can become, he can be reader until age 20. 
after that, he says, otherwise, if you weren't baptized as an infant, you must be reader and exorcist for at least five years, then acolyte and subdeacon for four years, and then he must be deacon for five years. So, uh, let's see, I haven't done the math on this one. What is that? 20 plus 5, 29, uh, that, uh, 20, 34. Is that 34? I'm not quite sure. But I, I think, because um, I don't, I, it's got small print here, but I think that would put you, the early should be a priest is at 34. Also, during this, just a side note, Leo the Great said that in order for a nun to receive the veil, from a bishop, she must have retained her virginity her whole life until the age of 40 before she received the veil. So it's interesting, as I was reading these things in the, Pont the Liber Pontificalis, you see that in the early church there was grave reservation. No consecrated virgins till age 40, no priest until age 52. They were taking things real serious back then. Okay, so back to priest. Uh, the Catechism of the Council of Trent speaks of an internal priesthood and an external priesthood. And uh, this goes back to the Old Testament. The Catechism explains regarding the internal priesthood, all the faithful are said to be priests once they have been washed in the saving waters of baptism, especially in this name given to the just who have the Spirit of God and who by the help of divine grace have been made living members of the great high priest, Jesus Christ. For enlightenment by faith, which is inflamed by charity, they offer up spiritual sacrifices to God on the altars of their hearts. Among such sacrifices must be reckoned every good and virtuous action done for the glory of God, etc. So the internal priesthood is what we would call the general priesthood of the baptized. The external priesthood, says the Roman Catechism. Y'all like how I keep showing it? Get one. Get you one. See, it's like, it's got shiny powers. It's great. The external priesthood, on the contrary, does not pertain to the faithful at large, but only to certain men who have been ordained and consecrated by God to the lawful imposition of hands and by solemn ceremonies of the Holy Church and who are thereby devoted to to a particular sacred ministry. And it goes on to talk about examples from the Old Testament. So the internal priesthood is something that we all have, and it talks about it's internal. You know, for lay people, for me, for all of y'all watching, the altar that we offer on is not an altar in our house. It says here it's the altar of our heart. And we offer the sacrifice of prayers and good deeds to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The external priesthood offers external sacrifice, the holy sacrifice of the Mass, on an external altar in an external church built for the glory of God. So y'all can see the distinction here. Contemporary language would use general, general priesthood of the baptized and ministerial priesthood of holy orders. Now, the Catechism of the Catholic, uh, of the Council of Trent, talks of degrees of priesthood. And it says that the basic fundamental degree of priesthood is the priest, right? The presbyter. Uh, that's pretty much obvious. And then, so, so here's the difference between pre-Vatican II and post-Vatican II understanding of the bishop. And I'm going to use non-official language. Just to make it, I think it, this analogy helps us modern people understand what ancient people thought about this. So for Thomas Aquinas and for the ancients, the highest thing you could do was consecrate the body, blood of Jesus Christ. Now a bishop can administer holy orders. A bishop can admin, administer confirmation. Uh, the bishop can consecrate churches and consecrate altars. So there's things that bishops can do that normal priests can't do whatsoever. However, Thomas Aquinas notes that consecrating the body and blood of Jesus Christ is a higher gift, a higher charism than consecrating altars or administering holy orders or administering confirmation. So that makes priesthood the highest order, but priesthood itself derives from the apostles, the 12 apostles. 
And the priesthood can, in fact, be limited. It is limited so that your normal priest, your pastor, he can't do holy orders. Now, people argue, is it metaphysically impossible? I follow that tradition. It's metaphysically impossible for a priest to do holy orders. It's metaphysically impossible for a priest to consecrate sacred chrism, uh, to consecrate, a, you know, I guess an altar even, right? He's not a bishop, so he can't do it. But the way the ancients thought of it is like when you buy software and loaded into that software are all these extra features, right? And it's in, it's in the software, but you can't use it. And so what happens when a man, a priest is consecrated as a bishop, and that's a, that's an important distinction. The seven orders we went through are ordained. They are ordained into an order, seven orders. In the traditional language of the church, and if you hang around with traditional Catholics, you'll hear them say this, bishops aren't ordained bishops. They are consecrated bishops. And that's because the, the thinking here in the old days was is that the priest came with the software, but it was, it was locked down. When he was consecrated a bishop, it opened up all the features, the full high priesthood, not just the priesthood, but the high priesthood of Jesus Christ and all the apostolic functions. So when a priest is consecrated as a bishop, it unlocks these powers of holy orders, um, consecrating holy chrism, consecrating altars, etc. So that's why the catechism of this is a magisterial book, guys. That's why in Thomas Aquinas and they speak of the different degrees of priesthood. So you have priesthood, which we've talked about. The next degree happens after the consecration to the episcopate. He becomes a bishop. Here's what the catechism says. The second is that of bishops who are placed over the various dioceses to govern not only the other ministers of the church, but the faithful also, and to promote their salvation with supreme vigilance and care. Hence it is that in sacred scripture they are often called pastors of the sheep. Their office and duty has been well described by St. Paul in his sermon to the Ephesians, as we read in the Acts of the Apostles, while St. Peter, the Prince of the Apostles, has laid down a divine rule for the exercise of the Episcopal office. And if bishops strive to conform their actions according to this rule, there can be no doubt that they will be good pastors and will be esteemed as such. Bishops are also called pontiffs. This name is derived from the pagans and thus designated their chief priest. Now, here's another Latin word of the week. It comes from pontifex, and it means uh, fex comes from factor, builder, and pontiff, that part there means bridge. So a pontifex or a pontiff is a bridge builder. He holds the bridge together, builds it between, in, this, in the pagans, with the worshiping of demons, they thought that they were building bridges to the gods, but they were really building bridges to the devils, the demons. But when the Catholics came through and received the kingdom of the Roman Empire, as prophesied in Daniel chapter 2, they also took that word, the pontifex, and applied it to the Pope and to other bishops. Right, So they are pontiffs. They are bridge builders holding the bridge between us and Jesus Christ through the sacraments. We can all go straight to Jesus by baptism and confirmation, but through the sacraments, our connection with Christ through the sacraments is in fact through the bishop. The next degree of priesthood is archbishop, and those are also distinguished as metropolitans. All metropolitans, let me think of this, is this right? All metropolitans are archbishops, but not all archbishops are metropolitans. For example, Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano is an archbishop, but he's not a metropolitan. Whereas the Metropolitan Archbishop of New York is both a metropolitan and an archbishop. Anyway, the second that, that degree is archbishop. The next degree, according to the Catechism of Trent, is patriarch. And it says in old days, there was the patriarch of Alexandria, which was founded by St. Mark. There was the patriarch of Antioch, which was founded by St. Peter. There was the Patriarch of Jerusalem, of course, founded by the Apostles, the first one being James, the brother of the Lord. And then, Johnny come lately, the Patriarch of Constantinople, which currently is, and regretfully, schismatic. 
The other ones are a little bit complicated because there's Eastern Rite patriarchs for the other ones, but Constantinople, not so much. So that's the seven orders. We did it. Hip hop hooray. We did the seven orders. We did Tanjir. We talked about the three kinds of Tanjir. We did the seven orders. And then we talked about that consecration, which unlocks the features of the sacerdote and makes him a high sacerdote, a high priest. And then we talked about those different grades, bishop, archbishop, patriarch. Oh, and then I, I think maybe I closed the book too early. Um, does he put Pope on here? Yeah, he does. I closed the book too early. Um, after patriarch comes Pope. And I want to read this because this is, this is good stuff. Catechism of the Council of Trent, a.k.a. Roman Catechism. Above all these, the Catholic Church has always placed the Supreme Pontiff of Rome, whom Cyril of Alexandria, Alexandria and the Council of Ephesus named the Chief Bishop, Father and Patriarch of the whole world. He sits in that chair of Peter, in which beyond every shadow of doubt the Prince of the Apostles sat to the end of his days, and hence it is that in him the church recognizes the highest degree of dignity and a universality of jurisdiction derived, not from the decrees of men or councils, but from God himself. Wherefore, he is the father and guide of all the faithful and all the bishops and all the prelates, no matter how high their power and office, as the successor of St. Peter, as true and lawful vicar of Christ our Lord, he governs the universal church. For one has been said, therefore, pastors should teach what are the principal duties and functions of the various ecclesiastical orders and, degree, and degrees, and also who is the minister of this sacrament. End quote. Now, there's a lot more that goes on. It talks about the holiness of life required of priests, their knowledge, their theology, their canonical fitness, and it also ends with a great admonition to those who would receive any of the seven holy orders uh, or perhaps the further degrees of bishop, archbishop, patriarch, or pope. So thanks so much, guys, uh, for watching. I just wanted to do a, a, a little a sample of what we're going to be doing next year at the new St. Thomas Institute when we start to, to study the history of the Roman Rite. We'll maybe talk a little bit about the Eastern Catholics, uh, maybe have a little module or a little course on that, but we're primarily going to focus on the largest and the biggest right, and that is the Roman right, and particularly how it was before it was changed by Pope Paul VI. I should mention uh, before we close down that it was, I'm going to pull this up here, it was uh, Paul VI who uh, got rid of the minor orders, and let me give you the year for that in the document. So uh, Pope Paul VI in his motu proprio uh, dated August 15th, 1972, said that the term minor orders has been replaced by that of ministries. Two of what were called minor orders, that of reader and acolyte, are kept throughout the Latin Rite, and national Episcopal conferences are free to use the term subdeacon in place of acolyte. That's kind of confusing, I know. Um, and then uh, before this, uh, Paul VI also changed the, uh, the structure of the diaconate by admitting, admitting married men to the diaconate. That happened in 1967. So for young men now who are going through seminary, they will first be made, they'll be instituted in the ministry of lector, and then instituted in the ministry of acolyte, and then they will receive deacon and priest. Whereas if you go to a traditional seminary, like the Fraternity of St. Peter, you will run through, you'll begin with porter, and you'll go right on up, if you stick with it, when you get subdeacon, celibacy, divine office, deacon, priesthood. It's still it's still retained in these, in these traditional movements and traditional orders. And I've even heard that Sometimes outside these orders, for example, there was a, believe it or not, believe it or not, a Jesuit, a young Jesuit who asked the Jesuit, can I receive the, the, the whole stair step, put it on the screen for you, the whole stair step of the minor orders. And they said, yes. 
And so, uh, here, let me turn that off. And so this Jesuit recently uh, was able to receive it. And it's kind of interesting when you read uh, modern church history beginning in the, uh, well, really beginning in the 70s, 72 or so, when seminary started ceasing giving the minor orders, a lot of the seminarians were, were understandably confused and upset. They said, well, hey, I don't, I don't want to jump orders. I want to go, you know, I want to, if I'm a porter, you know, I should next become a lector and then an exorcist and then an acolyte. And the seminary said, well, sorry, that's, that's old, that's gone. And so this was actually one of the reasons uh, initially why the Society of St. Pius X was formed as a seminary around Archbishop Lefebvre, uh, because people, these priests, I'm sorry, not priests or people, these seminarians were looking for a traditional formation that ran them through the minor orders up through sub, subdiaconate, deacon, and priest, and they could no longer get that in their seminary. So they were going you know, to Switzerland and, and trying to supplement. So there it is. If you've enjoyed it, uh, I'd encourage you to, um, again, if you sign up now for a new St. Thomas Institute, we're not going to do the Roman Rite. That starts in January. But if we have other cool stuff too. We're doing, uh, like I said, the Old Testament, every book of the Bible. How does Christ fit in every single book of the Bible from Genesis all the way through 2 Maccabees? Um, we are going to be recording the last eight courses, actually this Friday, um, the last eight uh, courses of the Old Testament. Most of it is already up at NewStThomas.com. It is currently closed. There is a wait list. So go to NewStThomas.com and you can get on that uh, waiting list and we'll open up new spots on September 10th, first come, first serve. So if you get in line today, uh, you'll probably get a spot since it's, you know, a little bit out from now. I'll put it, there you go. You can see it on the screen. That's what it looks like. So, um... A great opportunity, low cost tuition, great value. Uh, our retention rate is, I think, 94, 95% over the years. So people who join stay. That's why our spots are limited. So anyway, uh, we're live today. I'll close us in a prayer. We already did Latin words. So we did, uh, what did we do? Sacerdos and we did Pontifex. Both great, uh, great words for today. So um, Latin prayer card on the screen. There it is. In nomine Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus et benedictus fructus ventris tu, Iesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, or per nobis peccatoribus, nunc et etor mortis nostre. Amen. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto, sicut erat in principio et nunc et semper, et in secula seculorum. Amen. And dear Lord, I ask your blessing and your favor upon everyone watching, that you would send your Holy Spirit into their hearts and enlighten their minds, enlarge their hearts to love Jesus Christ and to be great missionaries and apostles in this world. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. St. Pius X, pray for us. All holy martyred popes, pray for us. Nomine Patris, et Fidii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Take that card off. All right. Well, um, everybody, thanks for watching. As I always say, it's a little bit slower paced because I don't have a guest. I don't have Tim with me. Um, pray that rosary every day. Our Lady came down from her throne at the right hand of her son, Jesus, in 1917. And one of her messages was pray the rosary every day. Five decades every day takes you less than takes you about 15 minutes everybody's got 15 minutes every day for God and it will make you holy it will give you peace it will get you out of sin it will draw you closer to Jesus it's a great great tool weapon and mystery in your life so follow those mysteries pray those mysteries meditate on those mysteries and pray the bare minimum five decades. If you're not praying the rosary, you're not on the team. It doesn't matter how much you know about holy orders or the council of Trent, how much you read, you know, this book. If you're not praying the rosary, you're not on the team. So pray the rosary, become a great saint, and I'll see you, I'll, uh, I'll see you in videos to come. Maybe with some guests, maybe alone. Adios. Bye.